In today's presentation, the goal will be to give you a very good overview of Margaret Heritage's formative assessment feedback loop, explaining the different components and how they all tie together. What you're looking at on this slide is actually a visual representation of what classroom teachers do every day in their classrooms. What actually has happened here with the visual graphic is she's broken down the segments of the, the different elements that actually compro compromise and make up that entire feedback loop of information from the teacher to the student. In her book titled Formative Assessments, Making It Happen in the Classroom, she outlines the everyday work of teachers in the classroom. Her book does an excellent job of translating theory and practice into actual practice in the classroom. She defines formative assessments as a process and goes in depth to describe the elements of the process and the contribution that each one makes to improve student learning. The feedback loop according to Sattler, actually include a teacher who knows which skills are to be learned and can recognize and describe good performance, demonstrate good performance, as well as indicate how poor performance can actually be improved. According to Sattler, formative instructional practice is not one more thing for teachers to do. It is actually embedded. It is a way to short circuit the randomness of inefficiency of trial and error learning and keep the learning moving forward. So why feedback? Well, formative instructional practices and assessments can actually enhance the learning when it provides students with the feedback about specific detailed qualities of their work and what needs to occur in order for them to improve their learning. Again, this is actually what happens in the classroom when formative assessments or formative instructional practices are taking place. The first thing that I would see if I walked into a classroom where this was taking place is that the teacher had very clear learning goals and criteria for success for the students. Heritage states that the learning goals and success criteria drive the entire formative assessment process and need to actually be clearly articulated by teachers and clearly understood by students. She goes further to state the importance of identifying the learning goal first rather than the activities which t teachers are often tempted to do from the learning progressions and then specifying the criteria for success. Selecting those formative assessment strategies then that match the goals and criteria can only be done when the goals and criteria are very clearly identified. The learning progressions actually describe a pathway of learning for students and teachers. Explicit learning progressions can actually assist the teachers to plan their instruction and formative assessments. Learning goals and success criteria drive the process of the formative assessment. The success criteria are really just checks on learning that the student can use as they monitor their own learning. The learning goals and success criteria need to be communicated to students in language that the student can actually understand. During classroom instruction, teachers use a variety of strategies to actually elicit as evidence of how student learning is evolving towards the overall learning goal. There is not a single way to actually gather the evidence from formal, formative instructional practices and questioning. We want to simply identify when you want to elicit the evidence within the lesson, then determine the type of evidence you actually need to help you understand the student learning. You can select from a menu or smorgasbord of formative instructional practice options that's actually aligned to the learning goal and appropriate to the purpose and criteria for success. Use multiple sources of evidence, triangulation. But again, what is most important when eliciting evidence is that the success criteria, the goal, and the evidence are aligned. The formative assessment strategy must be aligned and linked to the success criteria. In order to evoke evidence of learning, teachers actually have to establish a classroom culture where students feel safe to give and receive food feedback. A classroom culture where students feel safe is typically characterized by distributed power along with trusting collaborative relationships. Evidence of learning can be gathered by utilizing teacher-led formative instructional practices, student self-assessments, and peer assessments. According to Heritage, on page 81 of her book, in order, to feed, in order for feedback to be formative, 
it must lead to new learning. Teacher feedback should provide information to the student relating to the actual task of process of learning that fills the gap between what is understood and what is aimed to be understood. It should also include specifics regarding particular qualities of the work with advice on what they can do to improve. These, both of these statements are statements from Haiti as well as Black and Williams 90, 1998 publication. <coughs> Formative assessment strategies need to also provide sufficient detailed information to take action. The formative assessment strategy should be planned at the same time as instructional plans are made, but they can also arise spontaneously in the classroom. As you interpret the information gained from, assessment, from the assessment strategy, you will learn the gap will identify itself precisely since, of course, the assessment strategy is perfectly aligned to the success criteria and the learning goal. Because the gap will actually differ among your students, differentiated instruction should be an outcome of formative assessments. Now the learning goals, as well as the success criteria, are not actually fixed and can change and should change as a result of implementing the lesson. Once the gap has been identified, the teacher should have plans for how the lesson plan will be differentiated to meet the various learning gap needs in the classroom. The teacher will need to set the new learning goals and clearly communicate the new criteria for success to the students. It is critical to the learning process that teachers communicate the learning goal and the criteria for success at the outset of the lesson and again when the lesson is modified. Learning goals actually focus students' attention on what it is they are to learn, as opposed to the tasks that they are to complete. This enables students to know what they are learning and why, which results in students becoming active participants in their learning process, instead of passive recipients. The instructional learning goal identifies what the students will learn during the course of the lesson or lessons. The success criteria identifies what it takes to meet the learning goal and are used as checks on learning. Now that we've clearly described the criteria for success and, they, the, and have adjusted it according to the differentiated instruction and the information that we've received from the formative assessments, We've adapted, we, we're now ready to actually adapt our instruction, instructional strategies to respond to the stu teachers, to the students' learning needs. Now, we have clearly described the criteria for success as well as how that criteria for success has ad been adjusted. We're modifying our plans and adapting and responding to our, the learning needs of our students. And this is what takes us now into that differentiated instructional process with the scaffolding, scaffolding our lessons and actually targeting our instruction to the zone of proximal development for each of our students or group of students. All of this pulled together is actually what allows us and enables us to actually close the gap. Now when we're talking about closing the gap, we're actually talking about the learning gap. We're not talking about closing the achievement gap. That would be the NCLB accountability requirement. When talking about closing the gap using formative assessments, we're actually talking about closing the learning gap. The gap between where the child is and where we want the child to be. Once one gap is closed, another one is actually opened. Learning is a continuous process. When one gap closes, opportunities for new learning occurs. It's actually our jobs as, job as educators to continue stretching our students' learning. Whew, we can take a deep breath now. I hope I've clearly explained each of the elements of the formative assessment feedback loop. And again, 
All of these elements are things that teachers do every day naturally in their classroom. The purpose of going through this presentation is really for us as educators to really understand and know where we are and what we're doing because it allows us to more intentionally focus our planning in the right stages so that we clearly recognize when we need to what stage of the loop we need to revisit and go back to. Please feel free uh, to look at any of the resources that I've used to compile this presentation as well as contact myself, Dr. Brenda M. Arrington, or any of my colleagues that are in your area if you have further questions. Thank you.